You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. And this is a Bible answer. This television program is dedicated to answering Bible questions from viewers just like you. At the halfway point of our program and again at the end, you'll see our contact information where you can call us, write us, or email us your Bible question and we'll seek to answer it on a future program of a Bible answer. We're thankful to the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee for overseeing this good program. And we're thankful to our three guest panelists today. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Robert Taylor. I'm a member of the Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee. Do gospel meeting work, lectureships, and much in the way of religious writing. My name is Hal Ferguson. I'm the Congregational Minister of the North Jackson Church of Christ in Jackson, Tennessee. I'm Skip Andrews. I preach for the Dresden Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. Again, we're grateful to these brethren for being with us and doing such a good job in answering your questions. Our first question today goes to Brother Andrews. Brother Andrews, the person says, Why did Rachel steal the family gods in Genesis 31, 19? Brother Andrews. Thank you for this. It's been a rewarding thing to study this chapter and look for the answer and some other things that I found as I studied. And if you do have a Bible, this would be a good question for you to go to it and look at some of these verses with me for the next two or three minutes. Genesis 31, 19 is the text from which the question comes. It says, And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. Now the first five books of the Old Testament were written by Moses. And as you read through these stories, you need to stop and think sometime, who's saying the thing I just read? And this is being said by Moses, the author of the book, hundreds of years after the event. As you read through Genesis 31, you find out that Laban and Jacob never do find out what they want to find out and never know for sure who did what. I think that's important for us to know. But at the same time, remember, Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, did say that she stole them. And I looked up the word stolen, and it means stolen. <laughs> she took something she had no right to have. And so that she did, and that was wrong. The images that were her father's, the word image there is teraphim, and it has a variety of definitions and meanings, and it can mean household gods. It can mean other things that don't necessarily imply some sort of false worship or something. I and mean, we're not told anywhere in the story how they use these images in this family. So I'm not going to concern myself with that unless I get more information. But why did she do that? And I'm sorry to tell you in a way that I don't know why she did it. The text doesn't say. And we could speculate, give all kinds of reasons why somebody might steal something. And I could, that would be a good thing to do, but for us to identify her reason, I don't think is possible. So then that led me to the question, well, why is this in here? What is this story about? And if you read on down through, I think you find something very interesting that happened. Laban and Jacob had been at odds with one another for a lot of reasons for a long time, years. A son-in-law and a father-in-law. And here... Laban says later on in the chapter that, that these things have been stolen. I want to know who did it. And so they are going to go find out from the people in this journey who have left secretly. They actually had stolen away at night, the text says, the same word. And they had, they had left to get away secretly. And now he catches up and says, someone stole my teraphim and wants to know who did it, why they did it, and all of that. Well, they do an investigation 
Jacob never finds out in this text or any other one that we know of that Rachel did it. Laban never finds out in this text or any one that we know of that she did it. We know she did it. Moses knows she did it. So what happens? What happens is that these two men who have been at odds with one another all of a sudden decide to reconcile without ever being satisfied about the issue at hand. They find a bigger issue. I think this is really important that we get the meaning of a story by continuing to read and finding out what is this really about. In uh, verse 36, Jacob was angry, chode with Laban. Jacob answered, said, Why, what is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued? They're escalating this thing. And then almost immediately after all of that, it says in verse 44, 45, Now therefore come, let us make a covenant. I and thou, let it be for a witness between me and thee. And they do it. They make a covenant. They make a pact. They make an agreement. And they settle it. They reconcile without either one of them ever getting satisfaction on whatever it was that had happened, or at least they said it happened. And again, they don't know for sure, but they reconcile. To me, that's the most important thing about this chapter, is that there's a reconciliation that comes from it. Maybe Rachel learned her lesson too. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. Give them back, fess up. I don't know what she did. But reconciliation is really important, and they made monuments to their reconciliation. They wanted people to know that they had done that. And I think that's a good thing to get out of this story, whether we ever know why she stole those things or not. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Brother Andrews. That is an interesting story from Bible history, isn't it? Brother Taylor, this question, is the Holy Spirit a person or just an influence or power force? Brother Taylor. It always amazes me that there seemingly are more misconceptions about the Holy Spirit than about the other two in the Godhead. I know we have misconceptions about God the Father and about Jesus Christ, but it just seems to me that there are so many, many misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an influence uh, in the sense that people usually use that. Certainly he's not a cosmic force or a powerful force. He, in every sense of the term, is a person. God the Father, the first person, is of that individual category. And Jesus Christ is a person. And the Holy Spirit, one of the Godhead three, is likewise a person. Not only is he a person, but he is a masculine person. Look at the language of Jesus in John 14, 15, and 16. By the way, these three chapters constitute what we sometimes call the upper room discourse, delivered on Thursday night before Jesus went to the cross the following Friday morning. And I'm of the conviction that if a person has a good understanding of John 14, 15, and 16, that many of the misconceptions that have developed about the Holy Spirit will be cleared up and cleared up immediately. Notice what Jesus had to say in John 16, 13, and 14. How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall convey or, or con deli deliver it unto you. Notice the pronoun usage here. These pronouns suggest not an influence or a powerful force. They are suggestive of personality. And certainly and eminently, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is mentioned in Genesis 1 and verse 2. I'm convinced that the entire Godhead is mentioned in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, coming from the Hebrew word Elohim, the word for God, suggestive of a plurality. We read in Genesis 1-2, out that the Spirit of God, that's the third person in the Godhead, moved or brooded upon the face of the waters. He is the one that inspired the scriptures. The Bible tells us in 1st, 2nd Samuel 23 and 2 that the Spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. And Paul expressed it this way in 1st Corinthians 2.13 
which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Bible tells us in a sweeping affirmation that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3 and 16. And holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit that's found in 2 Peter 1 and 21. And hence, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a divine person. He is a, a masculine person. And yet, so many people have misconceptions about him. One of the misconceptions is that he is an originator of truth. I think that fails to take into consideration that Jesus said he shall receive of mine, that is from me and the Father, and he will convey it unto you. The Holy Spirit, therefore, is a revealer of truth, and he is the conveyor of truth. That's why it is suggested more than once in the New Testament that he is the spirit of truth. He is a most interesting and challenging personality, and I enjoy preaching lessons about the Holy Spirit and writing in regard to him. I thank the individual for turning in this eminently worthy question and hope that my remarks will be helpful along that line. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled The Vine and the Branches. Written by Brother Perry B. Cotham. It's a wonderful tract. There's a lot of misunderstanding about that parable that Jesus told. If you'd like to have this great tract, or if you'd like to receive our eight-lesson Bible correspondence course, all of our materials are absolutely free to Bible answer, and we'd like to supply you with them. And so, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net or you can talk, call our toll free number 1 800 436 0463. We're also pointing out our website to people www.abibleanswertv.com. We encourage you to go there as well and look at past programs of a Bible answer. And uh, we also have a YouTube channel and you can access it by our website. You can even watch a Bible answer on your mobile devices, your tablets, or your phones, and we encourage you to do that. Back to our questions today, our next question to Brother Ferguson. Brother Ferguson, the person says, why do so many people find worship boring? Brother Ferguson. Thank you for the question. This question, honestly, reminds me of one of those loaded questions that you sometimes hear where somebody will say, well, have you stopped beating your wife? And, and uh, it's a loaded question because the assumption is that you do currently beat your wife or you did in the past beat your wife. Either way, there's no good answer. And so it, it's just kind of like that. It's somewhat of a, of a, of a loaded question, you might say, um, in that I don't necessarily agree that so many people find worship boring. Maybe the person who sent this question finds uh, worship boring, and if he does, and I, I'm truly sorry about that, However, I don't find worship boring, and, I, and I'm certain that the men serving with me on this panel this morning uh, certainly do not find that worship is boring. But maybe the questioner thinks that worship is boring. Maybe he thinks that uh, his preacher is boring, and maybe he's not a silver-tongued orator, and, uh, and therefore he considers him boring. But if he's preaching the Word of God, if he's preaching the truth, and he's preaching it to the very best of his ability, then uh, he, he is standing among uh, some very tall men in the, in the Bible, uh, such as Moses and Paul, who did not consider themselves uh, great orators. Uh, they were, however, some of the greatest spiritual leaders uh, in history. But again, I mean no disrespect to the questioner or, or anyone else who may feel that worship is boring, but the truth about worship to Almighty God is that you get out of worship what you put into it. If you come into worship and you come in, for example, Sunday morning and you didn't get enough sleep, uh, you didn't prepare yourself, uh, didn't, uh, didn't uh, rest enough, or, or didn't prepare yourself mentally, spiritually, or physically, um, and, and didn't spend time in prayer or Bible study, then, then yes, I suppose that your worship could be considered boring. But there's another thing to remember about worship, and that is that worship is not a spectator sport by any means. Our coming together in worship is not a time to be entertained by the preacher or the song leader and others who are serving uh, and uh, those who are serving in the worship. Uh, they're not to entertain you or me like 
uh, entertainers or actors on a stage. God is the spectator, and we are the uh, actors. We are the performers, if you will. We are the ones who are to perform and uh, to act as we engage in worship. And, you know, look at it from God's standpoint. Does God sometimes consider my worship boring? Does he sometimes consider your worship boring? In other words, when God sees that my worship is, is uh, lazy or lackadaisical or indifferent, how does he feel about me? Especially since he's the one who gave me the very best gift, that is the gift of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. But Christians who, who believe and, and start to think that, well, worship is boring, I, I believe they have a, a spiritual uh, issue that needs to be resolved. And I would encourage those who feel this way to, to restore unto themselves uh, the, the joy of God's salvation as David pleaded for in Psalm 51 in verse 12. Uh, they need to repent of their lukewarmness like the Laodiceans in Revelation 3 in verse 19. And they need to return to their first love and do the first works like those of the church at Sardis in Revelation 2 verses 4 and 5. When I think about the horrible fate that awaited me because of my sins and uh, how that my situation was so hopeless, I'll never see worship uh, to God, who is my Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior, as anything that is boring. Thank you very much for this question. Thank you, Brother Ferguson, for that good answer. To Brother Andrews, we have this question that's been sent in. They asked, to what was Paul referring when he said, touch not the unclean thing in 2 Corinthians six seventeen, Is he referring to unclean animals or what? Brother Andrews. Let's begin with a reading. I want to read from that text, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through the first verse of the next chapter. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The question has to do with the unclean in verse 17. Touch not the unclean. And what is that? Well, my answer includes the, question, the answer that it's not talking about animals except maybe by a reference to the Old Testament by implication that there were unclean and unclean and clean animals then and that they were told to not touch the un, uh, unclean animal so that they had the concept that there is such a thing as clean and unclean. But beyond that, this is a spiritual thing here and not about animals. The New Testament is full of opposites, clean, unclean, holy, unholy, godly, ungodly. One of the great things you'll ever do in your life is to study some of those opposites because when we get those in our minds, we will see how easily we can decide whether or not a thing is clean or unclean because the Bible gives us the means by which we can determine that. Paul here is saying, do not touch that. So what do we mean when we mean clean and unclean? For example, Jesus says, you are clean through my word in John 15, 3. He cleanses the church through his word, Ephesians 5, 26. Paul said, cleanse your hearts and your hands, you sinners, or James did in James 4 and verse 8. And in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. So we get a really good idea about clean from those verses and many others. On the other hand, the unclean, or that which needs to be purged, is also spoken of in the Bible. In this very letter, after Paul discusses that, in chapter 11 or 12 and verse 21, he said, And lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and that I may bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. So unclean is in the bad category. 
Now let's go back to our text. I believe that Paul is stressing this subject here because he wants us to understand what God desires of us, from us, what he wants to be for us. In verse 16, he says, God says, I want to dwell in them. In verse 17, he wants to receive us. In verse 18, he wants to be with us. In verse 1 of the next chapter, he tells us, therefore, to cleanse ourselves. I think that's what he's talking about. Relationship with God can be maintained through cleanness and destroyed through uncleanness. Thank you for asking. Thank you, Brother Andrews. Now to Brother Taylor. The person says, if you believe Mark 16, 16, why don't you believe in the healing and miracles of Mark 16 and 17? Brother Taylor. Thank you for the question. Mark 16, 16 states, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. And mention is made of healing. Mention is made of speaking in tongue. Mention is made of taking up deadly serpents. Mention is made of drinking any, uh, any deadly thing. And uh, there would be heavenly protection in revolve to those under consideration. Well, I truly believe in Mark 16, 16. For many years, at the end of my radio program in Ripley, Tennessee, I always closed with Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But I also believe in all of the miracles that are incorporated and that are included in Mark 16, 17, and 18. These were the miracles that were performed by the apostle. I believe in the miracles that were performed by the apostles in the city of Jerusalem right after the church was established. I believe in the miracles that were done by Stephen. I believe in the miracles that were done by Philip. And both of these were not of the apostolic order. They belonged to the seven servants, uh, or they were among the seven servants of the Jerusalem congregation. I believe in the miracles that were performed by the Apostle Paul. There were only two groups of people after the church was begun able to perform the miraculous. One group would be the apostles, and we read about a number of miracles that they performed. Peter was able to raise Dorcas from the dead, Acts the ninth chapter, 36 through 43. Paul was able to raise from the dead Eutychus, who had fallen down from the third loft of the third window in Acts the 20th chapter. And then the apostles also had the power to lay hands upon individuals and transmit to them miraculous deed, miraculous powers. And that's exactly what they did with Philip, what exactly they did with Stephen. The apostle Paul in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, makes mention that he had laid hands upon Timothy. And Timothy had received a gift by the means of Paul's uh, laying hands upon him. These were able to perform the miraculous, but after the last one of these died, after the last of the apostles died, there was no one, absolutely no one, in possession, in possession of miraculous powers. I think we need to realize that Mark 16:16 16, 16 was permanent in its application and the miracles that are found in Mark 16, 17, and 18 were provisional. That is, they were temporary. They would last until the, the coming of the full Bible or the completed revelation, as Paul taught in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, as well as 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. And therefore, the miracles belong to the first century, and they were done in order to prove conclusively that the person who performed the miracle was a representative of deity, that he spoke by the authority of God the Father, by Christ the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. And so it's not the case of if we believe Mark 16:16, 16, 16, we definitely do. And we definitely believe in the miracles that were done by the apostles and those upon whom they laid hand. Ellen Harris had a debate in Ripley, Mississippi in 1974, and early in that debate, the man whom he was debating took the position that he could take up deadly serpents and they would not hurt him. Near the end of that debate, Allen brought a deadly rattler from Memphis, Tennessee to Ripley, Mississippi and kept it under cover for a little while. And then when he unfolded it, people in the school auditorium 
could hear the rattlers all over the auditorium. And Alan said, you told us early in that debate that you could take up a deadly serpent. Let's see you operate according to that. That man would not go near the cage. In fact, Alan put the cage in the direct line where he would usually walk from his table to the podium, and he would not go near that table. He would walk way around it. He was not willing to do that. And of course, a person is foolish who thinks that he has that power today. Some people have lost their lives thinking that they could handle snakes, and to come out, they ended up on the dead list. And so we need to understand that these miracles were done to, to confirm the word and to prove that the messengers had God sent authority behind them. Thank you for the question. We give our thanks to Brother Taylor, to Brother Ferguson, and to Brother Andrews. They've been doing a great job in uh, answering your questions. And we do appreciate their efforts very much. And we also appreciate you, our viewers, for sending us in these good questions. Please continue to do so. Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 13, 34. When I study the book of 1 Corinthians, I see that at Corinth, Love was not something that did abound, whether it be for God or for their brethren. And thus you have the wearing of human names, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 12, the practice of fornication, 5 and verse 1, lawsuits among Christians, chapter 6, misuse of the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. These were just some of the things that resulted. Are any of these indications of lovelessness with us today? Love is evidenced by faith and by works. The kind described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's patient, it's kind, it's humble, it's unselfish, it's open-minded, it's truth-centered, it's optimistic. Love for God and man is necessary today just as it was in Paul's time. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments, John 14 and 15. If you love the Lord, you'll obey his gospel by faith, repentance, confession, and baptism for the remission of sins. If we can assist you, please let us know. Thanks for watching, and remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the Faithful Church of Christ in your area.